right, so I um, have about 90 slides to go through. Um, it's already up on SlideShare, so if anybody falls behind or misses stuff, it's all available up there. Thanks for coming out and listening to this talk. This is part two of a presentation I gave to uh, Great Wide Open. The first part of the talk mainly stressed um, the motivators to change, like why modify a legacy platform, why move to the cloud, does it even make sense? You know, and maybe some useful criteria to identify candidates to even do that. Um, so this is the agenda that I'm gonna run through today. Uh, basically, who am I, an important announcement, which I'm sure everybody's already aware of. Some background, um, we'll talk about containerization, you know, different types of containers, which is nothing new, it's just jailing in the old mainframe world. Um, you know, then we'll jump into creating a local environment. Uh, this talk will focus on using Docker. Um, and to make that easier, I'm using Vagrant. You could use Chef or Puppet or, Puppet or whatever in Vagrant. And Docker is kind of cutting edge and not ready for prime time, but for a local development environment, it's interesting. Um, there are also some graphical interfaces and actually PaaS services online using Docker that, that kind of drive this point home that I'll mention as well and demonstrate some screen shares. Um, I'm not gonna do much interactive coding, maybe at the end, I kinda learned my lesson with that, but I'd rather cover as much ground. Every, all the examples are in the slides, so if somebody wants to go through and, and walk through uh, the, the, the sources, the information, the commands, it's all in the slides, so it just took me a weekend to go through that. Um, I'm gonna talk about Shipyard, which is a graphical UI for Docker. Um, and then go through a couple examples, a two container example, a containers run within VMs. So how do you, you know, put an application, offer it as, you know, software as a service, or basically an application as a service within a container, and then start, you know, designing an application so it's modular. And then get into some more advanced Docker use cases and, and hopefully point you to information that's useful if you're curious about this. Um, one of the cool things about this is this community has exploded in the last year, and there's over a thousand containers already available. So there's plenty of examples of uh, code and, and applications that people have already developed to reuse. So there isn't as much need to figure stuff out. There may not be literature or books. A Docker book hasn't even been released yet. But um, again, uh, you know, the founder of the company, Solomon Hikes, you know, he can search for all his work and he has a lot of demos and then there's a variety of production apps. So basically, who am I? Um, right now, I'm a software architect at Imploom. So and that's just a standard disclaimer because my opinions aren't my companies, even though maybe they should be. Um, I'm an evangelist of message-driven middleware, which means mainly Camel, but you know, Spring integrations good too. They're the same thing. Uh, you know, we're a middleware company essentially. Um, there's a lot of technologies in between there. Um, I joined uh, in Bloom in October, so and they'd been going on for about two and a half years. Uh, at one point, I had about 200 consultants up in New York working on it, so there's been a sizable investment. Um, just a lot of other stuff, so recent father, and that's my son who keeps me awake all night. So if I look tired, I am. <laughs> so there's an important announcement. Today is tax day, so if anybody forgot to do their taxes, you know, you might want to think about that, so. But, you know, the important point is it's saloon time, so. But anyway, uh, who am I? I'm not a DevOps specialist. This is uh, kind of a DevOpsy topic, but, um, you know, I think it's relevant for architects too because you know the whole topic of containerizing and creating a PaaS and decoupling and modularizing an app, that's an architectural concern. It makes DevOps life easy and they're basically our best friends. So you know, we want to keep them happy and if they can do their jobs, we can do our jobs as developers. Um, and I, it's something I just took an interest in a couple of weeks ago. A former colleague pointed me at this, Todd Nest, and he said, hey, check this out. And I was talking about containerizing and, and I have another friend at Red Hat who recommended it and I guess they're going in big on this as well. So it's, it's kind of the cutting edge, but it, in a lot of ways it's something that's been around since you know, the 80s or 90s. Um, so some background, uh, this presentation is available on SlideShare. Um, this is already available. So this is what I, the talk I gave about two weeks. This gives you know, an, 
less technical view of this problem or how to approach it and to sell it to management. And maybe some reasons and criteria for approaching that. And then uh, there's really only one file useful on here right now. And that's a vagrant file to uh, build the local development environment. But it's so easy there really isn't that much code to it. But the code examples we get to will mainly be discussing commands and um, you know, maybe some of the configuration files and syntax just to show what's possible and how this technology can be applied. Um, so the problem in a nutshell is, you know, you have this legacy monolith that may have been in existence for 20 years or five years or however long, and there's a child's toy that says something like this. I'm not gonna sing it and rupture anybody's eardrums. It would be pretty terrible. But, uh, you know, these are duples or whatever, so basically, you have this monolith, you break it apart, and you know there may be some pain, and my previous presentation goes over this in more detail. But ultimately, you reconstruct it, and life is easier, or it should be. Um, and it can be if the, if the right pieces are in play and, and you know, enough consideration is taken to assemble it in an intelligent manner. But basically, you know, this makes the case for containerization in a very simplistic way. Um, so running through, these are some of the points from my pre previous presentation. Um, there's something called the scale cube, which um, uh, I can't remember the name of the gentleman who presented it, um, but it's basically you have three axes, you know, scaling based on a uh, number of nodes, which is like load balancing wars, and then you have scaling based on partitioning. Then you also have scaling based on decomposition, which means taking services and scaling out in layers like caching or services or whatnot. Um, so, and those are all techniques that can be applied to legacy systems, and it doesn't necessarily mean ditching the entire system means peeling it apart like an onion or, or maybe absorbing part of it like the Borg, you know. Um, but it's identifying separation of concerns and proof of concepts are your friend. It, avoids uh, large capital investments and sunken costs. Um, there are different development environments. You can have private servers, you know, if it's business critical and you can't afford for Amazon to go down for even a minute, you know, you're gonna have your own private environment to run this in. Uh, in other cases, you can run this in the cloud safely if it's, uh, if you have processes that can be retried or, or they're not business critical, uh, that's safe. And then different platform architectures, everybody's heard of PaaS, and then XPaaS is, is a newer concept. Um, but this comes out of a Gartner study from a couple of years ago, and Red Hat's jumped on this. But basically, you know, this looks very familiar, and it's very common sense. It's creating an application from a bunch of different platform offerings, you know, which may be platforms, they may be services, they could be infrastructure underneath, whatever. Um, thanks. So um, this kind of makes the case for as you decouple and containerize, your containers may go in different places. You may want to off offshore them. You may want different vendors to absorb those functions. But that's where we get into containers. There are four different options right now that are prevalent. You know, Warden's been around for a while. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about them. They all kind of work in the same way. Um, Docker is, you know, the latest rage and is getting a lot of attention. Red Hat's behind it. You know, it came out of .cloud and cloudlets. Uh, Google's got an interesting candidate, which is certainly something to keep an eye on. Um, and then OpenVZ's been around for a while as well. Um, so what is a container virtu versus a virtual machine? Well, as you can see over here, a virtual machine, it shares a node, but it's an individual deployment of the same guest OS. You know, it encapsulates the application. You may have a complex stack up here that could be as simple as Tomcat or whatever. It could be a very robust stovepipe type application that has a lot of chef scripts to manage. Or else you could have a bunch of VMs that do the same thing. But ultimately, this is the way a lot of apps scale today. Um, containers, you know, it's a similar concept, except rather than having a different guest OS for each application, you try and reuse the operating system in a safe way. And, you know, this technique's been around forever, you know, as jailing in the Unix world, but basically you have a host OS and then you create groups and try and use 
uh, LXC, you know, Linux kernel features or groups and users, and try and insulate processes and threads. And you know, 20 years ago, this required a, a good sysadmin to coordinate with the developers, and it was definitely a consideration when building an application. Nowadays, it's easier to do this. You build a war, you drop it, and it's somebody else's problem to deploy. But coming back to this, this is easy because you can scale it. DevOps has more options. You can run everything on a development machine instance and whatnot. So what's Docker? I just pulled this off Wikipedia. They have some great information on the web. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, it automates the deployment of applications inside software containers. It extends LXC, which has been around since 2009 in the Linux kernel. It's just a high-level API to provide lightweight virtualization, essentially. Um, uses uh, C groups in the kernel itself. And unlike traditional VMs, it doesn't include a separate operating system, so it's lighter weight, which means your images are smaller. And the benefits of that we'll get to later on. Um, but mainly it gets to uh, versioning and managing, you know, your, rather than managing your code as separate versions, managing the actual images themselves and being able to apply deltas and roll back those sets and whatnot. Um, there are also advantages because the kernel provides uh, resource isolation. You can also leverage standard kernel features for security. You don't need to roll at your own uh, you know, security framework to manage threads or whatever. You can do that through native you know, Linux features or, or even IP tables or whatnot. And Docker offers a lot of functionality and, and some of frameworks do, this, do that very easily. Uh, Docker containers can be used to extend distributed systems so they run autonomously on a single machine and that basically reinforces what we were just, dis just discussing on the previous slide. It enables nodes to be deployed as resources are available. Basically it's a platform as a service model. It could be software as a service depending on what it's doing. Um, and there are already deployments for you know, Cassandra, React and about a thousand other technologies have been Dockerized. Um, and not to get confused with uh, Docker versus Chef or Puppet, it's a, it's a complement, it integrates with them. So these technologies would manage the virtual machine and Docker is, is a container that just falls inside. Um, again, it's a micro container for PaaS, it's open source, lightweight, uh, reusable, can run at scale on VMs, bare metal, the cloud, virtually anywhere. It's just containers that can be moved around easily. Um, there isn't a standard yet for, uh, you know, a, a, a virtual image yet, but I guess the industry is moving towards that. But Docker is, you know, probably the first step towards that. So someday there will be a standard behind this, kind of like VMX or, you know, virtual machine standards. For their images, you'll have, you know, virtual image standards. And I guess uh, VMware is, or whomever is working on, on some kind of a plugin for that type of a feature now to integrate that into their product. I can encapsulate any payload, so literally any kind of application you can run, can run in a VM can run within Docker. So if it's Java, Scala, whatever, Python, Vertex, it doesn't really matter. And it can run consistently. So the same behavior that you would get on a virtual machine that's running on your laptop, your Mac, your Windows, you know, if you're running Linux on your, your desktop, whatever, you get the same behavior as you would in production. Um, obviously, network issues aside, uh, but there are other ways to monitor that. Um, this gets into some of the why, and this is Docker Collateral from their web website. Um, they have some really good explanations. You know, it's been around for a while. Uh, Docker runs best on kernel version 3.8 or greater due to the virtualization API. It's more stable. Um, runs on any host distro, although Ubuntu and a few of the other major versions are preferred and seems to work better on that. Um, you know, it's a high level VM. It can run, it runs everything as root. You can configure your users to not run as root, but in production, obviously, you wouldn't want to do that. But for development, it makes life easier to be able to log in, just do Docker install and that kind of stuff. Um, at a low level, it's just, you know, change root on steroids, um, doesn't have its own installations, it isolates processes and it shares the kernel with the host. So you're getting a lot of reuse of the bare metal. Um, it's 
kind of weak on device emulation and, and some of the drivers, but uh, that's, again, this technology has really just sprung up at the end of the last year. Uh, how it works, uh, there are three components. There's a daemon, container, and repository. The daemon manages containers within a host, so basically you have this Docker agent that's installed in a host. Uh, you can install containers into the host, which the daemon manages, and then a Docker repository, which is basically like Maven Central, except for managing uh, Docker images. And we'll get into more about what a Docker image is in a few minutes, but it's actually pretty simple. Uh, each container that's running on a host has its own IP address, and there are different ways you can integrate it with the uh, net stack, so you can separate, separate VLANs and, and do all kinds of fancy stuff in isolation uh, with this, so it's very configurable. You can also multi-home it and share volumes, so you can have volume shares between containers, and you can manage that just like you would a, a traditional Linux system. <laughs> And uh, you can also plug that into a continuous integration system like uh, Jenkins to generate version Docker images. So you could have a full stack CI environment that's generating Docker images that you can then push out to your, to your hardware. And it, if this sounds a little bit like OSGI, it is kind of OSGI-ish, but it's not like a bundle. Um, it's a lot easier than even using Keraf and Blueprint. Uh, there's a supervisor management tool to manage processes within a container. I haven't really looked too much at that, that but, but it's available for more advanced uses. Um, so common use cases, you know, automated packaging and deployment. Uh, it's a lightweight PaaS environment. It automates testing and CI and deployment. Uh, it's easier to deploy and scale web apps. Um, it's been growing since December 2013, and Red Hat is... Uh, thrown a sizable investment behind it, and they're actually fast-tracking it to include it into their enterprise Linux distro. So this, this, this whole new technology isn't going away. I don't think it's a fad. I think it's going to become ingrained in, in certain Linux distros as a feature. Um, and they're planning, Docker is planning production support in December 2014 and, you know, services in 2015. And these are some, some uh, examples, and again, the slides are available online, but this is a subsample of what's available. So there are already, already, people have already you know, clustered Mongo and come up with ways to play Java apps on Docker, and it just, you know, basically you have a, a Docker app with cargo, and then you deploy into it. So you can have CI environments automate everything through an API. You know, very easy, you never touch the container, the container is you know, operating like a PCI type device where you have to push stuff into it, it can't ever reach out. Um, and then also, uh, you know, you have some desktop virtualization techniques, but typically uh, with the containers, you know, they're, they're not deployed with the UI. It's very lightweight. So if you were to, uh, you know, use VirtualBox or something like that as your uh, local VM provider, um, if you were to connect to it, you wouldn't have the UI. You can deploy it with that option, but typically it's, that's not how it's done. Um, so here are the basics. If you have Docker running in a VM on a host, what can it do? Well, basically, you know, from the host perspective, you have a Docker engine and a host. You may have a couple containers in the Docker distribution. You can pull or search or run Docker containers. Those come from a registry. Uh, the registry has a way of, of talking to an index, which is like a source code repo. You can have public repos or private repos, just like Maven. So there's actually a, a public Docker index, which has you know thousands of, of containers. You can go in there and search for stuff like Mongo, and you'll get 20 hits back for different things people have done with it on different distributions of Lin Linux, Ubuntu, or whatever. And then... Uh, or maybe in different versions of it or different clustering configurations. And uh, so it's very, very interesting in that respect. We'll get into that in a minute. Docker images, what's a Docker image? It's the basic building block of a Docker container. It's uh, similar to a slice of a VM image. Um, it does contain the application code or binaries, but it's not the same size as an OS. It's not like a gigabyte, you know, you might have a couple meg to a couple hundred meg typically. Um, 
and it basically encapsulates everything for an execution environment. Uh, the images can built, be built atop each other, which means that you could have three Docker images and each one is based on a base image. You can have a Docker image based on another Docker image and reuse uh, the definition from a previous container. Um, that way, when you pull it down locally, you're reusing what's already been deployed, and that's how you get the dynamic uh, you know, element level uh, version control. Um, an image contains only incremental changes. They're required to transform its base image, and we'll get into more of that later when we go over the Docker configuration file. But there's a, you know, a configuration file includes a set of run steps. And each one is atomic and there's a commit phase. So you can conceivably version all that independently and create intelligent deployers. Uh, the configuration can contain metadata such as how to run, you know, what's inside the image and which ports to expose and which user to use within the con container and whatnot. So the container is really you know, a self-contained, encapsulated, programmable operating system in a way, but it's not the operating system itself. It's isolated, um, but it is instantiatable. Uh, Docker container is, you know, a realization of a Docker image. You create a container from an image, um, and basically it's the result of starting a running process from an image and its dependencies. So there's a command we'll show later that gets into how to run a Docker image to create a, and spawn a container. You can create multiple containers from the same image. And you can, at the command line, specify different configuration parameters. Represents a single processor service. Uh, it's possible to share state between the containers, so you can share configuration. Uh, there are a variety of ways to do this. You can hard code it and have containers talk directly, which is very limiting. Um, you can also use ambassadors or other service discovery mechanisms to make it more flexible and dynamic so you can take up pieces and they can adapt or reconnect without affecting the client or the server. Uh, it's a very familiar life cycle, cycle, start, stop, and kill essentially. And you can actually create images from previously run containers. So you can run a container, pull an image from it, and use it again later on. So there's a lot of flexibility there. And again, this ecosystems developing, so in the future there will be even newer features. Um, this just gives a flavor of some of the more recent features of Docker, um, what they've added uh, in version 0.9. 1.0 is going to be the production release, and I guess that's going to be in about a month or so. But uh, basically they're trying to uh, eliminate the dependency on you know Linux virtualization control container and you know, add their own lib container. So basically, they're trying to manage the dependencies uh, with Linux and have their own API that abstracts that. Kind of like Java, you know, your JVM that can run in any operating system. Similar concept, because the goal of Docker is to have portable images that run the same anywhere. So it's very similar to a virtual machine, but at an operating system level. Um, so the natural question is, but we have Chef or, or something else. And, we don't want to upset DevOps ever. So, you know, this is a natural reaction. I had a discussion about this with somebody at work there. We don't need Docker. It sounds like Chef. And it's like, no, it's not replacing it. And this is from how layer of filth. And I don't mean there's any filth involved with Chef. But, um, you know, Docker is new and it's not ready for production. It's a light virtual machine. Uh, Chef is tried and true. It is for VMs. Uh, they can be used together. Um, I see them as compliments. And actually, there are some frameworks that are evolving that prove this. Uh, there's something called Deus, which scales Chef nodes and Docker containers. Deus actually uh, supports Heroku containers, too. So not only does it supports Docker, but supports Heroku. So there's, there's a convergence going on between the two. And there's a pretty cool uh, online PaaS called Suru. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But, uh, you know, basically it's a graphical way of, of configuring a PaaS, um, which uses, uh, you know, Docker-like uh, syntax. And it all reinforces the point that, you know, this containerization strategy is useful for encapsulating applications and services and deploying them as decoupled uh, uh, applications that aren't stovepiped together. At least there's some structure on how the configuration is managed. 
And we'll get into more strategies about that later on in the presentation. Um, so the doctor book, this is just a, a syllabus of what they're planning, uh, nothing earth shattering there. So again, a doctor deep dive. Um, just reinforcing that this has really taken off. So literally, you know, thousands, of like a thousand different projects have been doctorized. There's a lot of third party tools have been created, it integrates with everything pretty much. You know, OpenStack, um, Amazon, uh, you can run on bare metal or VMs or whatever. It just requires a Linux kernel. Um, so how to create a local environment. So if you want to use Docker, what do you do? And this is the interesting part of the, the talk. Um, basically, I'm focusing on VirtualBox. That's common. It's free. You can use this with Fusion or whatever you want. Um, uh, I have a GitHub repo where there's a single Vagrant file in there. Um, I'm using Vagrant to deploy because that's easy. Um, there's another option. You can, on a Mac, you can use boot to Docker, but there's a couple difficulties with that. It's a little bit more complicated for managing ports and volumes and some of the forwarding aspects, and also uh, like the home directories, depending on where the process is run from. So uh, for the sake of this talk, I'm, I'm just focusing on running everything from a VM. Um, so that matches uh, how production would be. But uh, boot to Docker is fine for Pox and it works and you know, it's definitely something that's going to evolve and grow over time. Um, creating an account with the Docker index, this is kind of like the Maven Central. So you can actually uh, create an account here, it's the website. Um, from the command line you can log in, it'll ask for your username, password, credentials are stored. And then this is the UI. So I'm logged in. I just searched for Hazelcast. I want a Hazelcast container to distribute. And I didn't find one. Um, so that's an opportunity for somebody to make one. But if you do a search for a lot of other things, uh, it's there. Like Mongo has a bunch of different hits. Just really random things. And you can even search for containers based on the name of the committer. Because um, usually it's committer slash you know, container. That's kind of the syntax. Um, which is, this is a good example. So at the command line, I did a more advanced search, some like Docker search hike. So what has the CEO of Docker created? So you can stalk other developers and borrow their code or emulate it. He has all kinds of cool stuff checked in. So there are all kinds of apps and, you know, CouchDB and different deployers and different types of applications and BitTorrent and whatnot. You can pull those containers down, get the code, look at how they're put together and try and figure this out. So it's a lot like Maven with source code in that you can see how they set up their environment, how they set up their dependencies. So there are, there are patterns that you can follow. Um, again, the, uh, you can pull down. If you're working within a Vagrant VM with Docker installed, you can pull uh, any, any Docker image you want uh, from any public repo. Uh, the syntax is similar for a private repo. I'll show that in a moment. but. Basically, it'll automatically pull dependencies too. So it'll do your transit of dependency management for you. Um, so the process of how you create a private repo, just for information purposes, I'll go over this quickly, but you know, there's a project that defines this and the readme has all the steps. Um, you just clone it, you know, modify YAML file that has some configs in there, and then it's just some Python, and boom, it's running. Um, this is an example of the configuration file. Uh, and again, the uh, information is in the PowerPoint here. Um, you can also uh, publish stuff or push stuff, pull images from a public repo and push them into your private repo. So if you want to work on you know, a project somebody else has created and, and modify it, you can do that. You can also do the converse of this as well. So it's very easy to move stuff around. Uh, this is the syntax. We're working with a local host. It's going to get easier over time. And again, this is command line, and there are going to be graphical interfaces for doing this in the future. Um, so what's a Docker file? The Docker file, you know, you have, we've talked about images. We've talked about containers. The Docker file is actually the configuration, the meta that creates what that, that image, what that Docker file container is. And it's used to build a container by scripting actions, and it's not based on that much. There's only six things that it really does. 
It's not as powerful as traditional configuration management like a chef or a puppet. But in discrete steps, you can, you can instruct it to build an image by taking, you know, doing app get and various scripting commands to build dependencies and basically to program your container to contain the components you want and to have the configuration and uh, actions that you need. And a clever structuring of commands will allow them to be cached and reused. Um, so this is a very simple Docker file to create a memcached uh, image. So you see, uh, and they say I'll always comment your code, that's just, you know, standard, standard shell syntax. You always start with a from, that's a base image. So if you have your own version of Ubuntu that already has memcached in here, you could have Ubuntu-memcached or whatever. So you can chain these together. Maintainer is just who's maintaining it. And since today's tax day, it's Uncle Sam. Um, Here's a command. You can execute, execute different uh, Linux commands and pipe them out, depending. You can do app gets and installs, all kinds of different stuff. Um, but again, you, you know, you're on, basically you can run as many run commands as you want. Uh, extending this, you have entry points. And entry point just triggers a command that's run when the container is started. And so if you start a container and you want a memcache daemon to start up, this is how you would configure to do. Alternatively, if you want to specify the user that that entry point uses, you know, it'd be this kind of syntax. Um, and then the other common need is to uh, expose ports because by default, uh, a Docker container is fully isolated like a sandbox. It can't reach out. You have to tell it to expose ports. So this is how you configure it to expose ports. So all of this ends up going into the Docker file. So once you have a Docker file, what can you do with it? A Docker file is used to build an image. So basically there's three ways you can do that. You can do docker build dot if you're in the same image. You can use standard in this way or you can build from GitHub. So if somebody else has a Docker file you want to reuse to build an image from, you can do that. Um, and then once you've built that image, it's stored locally. So for example, if you perform this command, this is what you'll see at the bottom. And you'll notice that there won't be a tag. That means you can't really do that much with it. It might tell you the size, and as you see, they vary in, in terms of what their contents are. So you can give it, a, you can rename it. So you can tag it with a name, or you can just use dash t tag to name it as part of the build command. So there's a lot of flexibility there. So how do you create a VM from all of this? So uh, this is the code I checked in. Again, it's just one Vagrant file. But basically, if you run that, you know, pull this down, install Vagrant, install VirtualBox, and you know, a couple of the plugins I have in the next slide. Just do Vagrant up. You might wait 15 minutes and it pulls down 400 mega files. But eventually, it'll spawn a container after it's pulled down Vagrant, Ubuntu, and everything. And then you can shell into it. And this is what the Vagrant file contains. So when you do a Vagrant up, this is what's invoked. It gets the box from this distro and from this URL. That's configurable. There's a lot of resources online. Dozens or hundreds of different boxes are already out there for this. Obviously, Vagrant's something that a lot of people have already used. Uh, you can configure it and specialize with VirtualBox. I want to use four CPUs on my Mac and eight gig and name the virtual box, you know, in case I'm spawning three different virtual boxes. You know, you can control all of that. Um, this just specifies some of the commands to install Docker. And um, you can do this manually. There are examples online, but it gets a little tedious. And I found this worked great. It installed the latest version of Docker for me, and dot one, and it didn't have any problems. This is necessary for refining, you know, the port forwarding, and you can get pretty fancy with this, but this basically just forwards everything within that range, which is most of what we use for a web server anyway, or different ports. Uh, using Vagrant, just a brief overview. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Uh, but basically, you know, once it's installed, if you type in Vagrant V, you should get the version back if it's installed. Different commands. Uh, you know, box, if you have multiple copies, you can destroy them. Reload, provision, you can shell in or start it up. And if you just do vagrant up, it'll look for a file called vagrant file in the local directory and use that. 
Uh, there are help commands, so you can do vagrant command H or the same thing on subcommands because you know, like the, there's a there's a lot of configurability and options there. Um, once a Vagrant VM is created, you can export it as a package. This is all standard. Um, you make sure to include your Vagrant file that you used. Uh, these are the plugins. Uh, basically, it provisions a local virtual machine. So, yeah, you can. Uh, the way this uh, specific ex example actually uses VirtualBox, but you could use Fusion or anything pretty much. So it's it's basically an agent to help manage your virtual environment. It'll talk to the API for the, the VM provider that's installed locally. And then there's syntax in the uh, in here so that it will know, like based on this, it'll know which, which version. And then you can say it based on the provider, you know, it can detect which, which type of VM it is and do different options. So you could actually have a Vagrant file that supports different types of VMs. So you could support VirtualBox and Fusion, whatever else, through one file. So. Um, yeah, so these are a couple plugins. Uh, with the VMware uh, VirtualBox, you have your guest plugins, which can be a bit of a pain to manage. Um, Fusion, you don't really have this problem, but uh, it's just a necessary evil. And with uh, VirtualBox 4.3 coming out, it seems like there's a bit of a lag. Most of the plugin versions are still 4.2 or 4.2.16, so it uh, seems to work fine, though. Um, and then this is like a Win file system thing. I think that's more for Windows, but those are informational purposes. So this is just an example of how to export a Vagrant box and to test it out because you can export it, configure it, add containers and whatnot, and then, then cut a package and then try starting up another version of that and spawning it and making sure it works properly. Um, that's some of the reusability of Vagrant. Pub and Chef could do the kind of the same thing. So this is just an easy way to do it locally. Uh, so installing Docker and you know they have this thing, will you be my container? It's supposed to be funny. Um, so Docker, it's already installed actually as part of that Vagrant file. So we start with the bare base box, uh, minimal effort, uh, didn't really need to do much with the components. Uh, how do you verify the installation? Well, after you do Vagrant SSH and connect into it, do a Docker info and you know, in a bare box, you'll see no images, no containers, and probably something like this. You want to make sure the kernel version is 3.8. If it's an older version, it may be flaky. It'll probably work, but you know, all bets are off. Uh, do a Docker pull busy box. You know, that's a commonly used uh, distro. Uh, after you pull that down, this will actually pull down four images, and that'll show that. Uh, so how to test it to make sure it works and it's configured properly within Vagrant. Um, again, sudo is optional. The distro I pulled already configures. I think it's configured by default to give root level access to the users. So you don't have to sudo for everything. But I just, like some installations will require you to sudo in unless you grant uh, the Vagrant or you associate the Vagrant user to this, you know, the super user group. Uh, so you can run the BusyBox example. If you do this at command line, the output would just be hello world. Um, this would run the command as a daemon. So basically it echoes. And if you do docker ps list, it'll show the processes that are running. And it'll show, excuse me, that container. Um, and you can also do, you can connect to it because this handle here for the uh, container ID is what's used to kill it, to connect to it, to see logs and that kind of stuff. So just a uh, quick recap <coughs> of the uh, container lifecycle. You can start, stop, restart, kill it, attach, wait, you know, usual stuff. You can also get information about your Docker container. Um, you can do PS and there are subcommands sub below that. Uh, you can inspect them, you can look at logs, you can attach, you can get, go to a console. And some of the cool things, when you connect to Docker containers, you can actually set them up so if you connect to a Postgres container, 
it'll show the PSQL console by default. You don't have to shell into it, it just does it for you. So it makes it very user friendly and it's a lot easier for DevOps to they log into a container and they're in the native shell already. Um, um, yeah, actually, if, if, if you're running an app server and you expose the JMX ports through an expose, then you could interoperate with that. And then you could have tooling that, that through JMX talks to different Docker containers that way. So that would definitely still be, you know, especially for a uh, virtualization containers or if you're using, you know, the different, uh, different monitoring apps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, camel and all that. Um, so there, one, one limitation is there's no easy way to import files in the file system, like if you're say Docker import, it's more about calling an API inside the container to pull something in. So it tries to separate the abstraction that way, and that's where something like a cargo, or even if you had Tomcat and you're, you're running Maven inside it, you do like a Tomcat deploy through Maven. Uh, same kind of paradigm. Uh, but you can copy files into the container file system. Uh, similarly, a Docker export, you can create a tarball tar from a container file system. This is basically like creating an export of a Docker container. Um, it's also possible to mount files and share them between containers as well. Uh, but again, the, to recap, the Docker image lifecycle, you can use Docker images to show all the images. Import will actually take the tarball, create a container for it. Uh, build will create an image from a Docker file. Uh, commit is implied in most of the Docker files. That will create an image from a container. So if you do a Docker build, the uh, commit's implied. Uh, RMI you know, removes it. Insert, uh, most of these others, I don't really use that much. Um, uh, 15 Docker tips. This is just for informational purposes. It's a bunch of shortcuts, uh, most of which we've already touched on, but it's kind of like a cheat sheet. Uh, so a graphical interface for Docker. Okay, so you've seen all this command line stuff that seems kind of old school. Um, how do you make this usable? There's two main interfaces right now. There are a couple others. Um, Shipyard and Docker UI. Shipyard's probably a little more functional. It supports multi-homing. And, you know, it's a little bit more intuitive, I think, to create containers and define linkages and, and configuration to share between them. It also manages images. Um, but uh, basically, yeah, it's multi-host support. You can create or delete containers, view images, build images. So basically do a lot of the stuff, same things that you do at command line. Supports private containers, and you, know, you can view container metadata. Uses Apache. Um, you can attach to containers, which means that you can attach to a container and use its internal shell. So if you have Postgres, then rather than doing command line, connect to it and get PSQL, you could do that through a web browser. So you get the same benefit. You just don't have to type anything. You're just pointing and clicking. Um, yeah, it could manage multiple machines. So you just put in one VM and then basically uh, a host, another host that has uh, uh, a Docker installation, you would register it with that shipyard deployment. So basically it kind of works like Splunk in that way you have to register back. So except you're not always forwarding events, you're just registering, so it's a little bit easier. And then the communication's automatic between them. Uh, there's a RESTful API, so I think that gets to know what you're discussing. So there's actually an API you can use to extend and add behaviors to. Um, supports container recovery, so you can mark it as recovered and you know manage versioning and upgrading more easily, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's very easy to install, so if you have a Docker host installing, let's say you have one VM, you want your shipyard installed in this one VM, and then you have 50 other VMs with Docker containers on there, pick your one VM, deploy shipyard to it, and then uh, you'll have an IP address for it, you can log in. And this is kind of the process to do on other nodes. So you need to register, install a uh, shipyard agent and then for each container, register it back because when you install Shipyard, it'll give you a key and then you have to register the key with each VM. So basically, it's kind of using a token-based authentication. And then this is the syntax here for how you would register it back. So from 
another IP address. You just point at the shipyard host and the port and give it the key that was generated and then it'll, it'll wire everything together for you. This is an example of what it looks like um, at the highest level. So these are the different containers that you know, the shipyard is aware of and there are different actions that pop down. Most of it's like create or destroy or life cycle related. Um, but this shows, you know, what the images are, so you can kind of poke around. Uh, if you wanted to inspect, you know, like let's say you had uh, the Redis example here. So if you were to drill into one of those, you could see more information about the environment, what is configured, and we'll get into why this is important in a couple of slides. Like how to share configuration to link containers together. Um, and this explains the ports that are exposed. And this is all determined by the Docker file that's used. Um, there's some other options here. So looks like kind of like the Tomcat configuration console. You can do logs. You can attach to it. And that's where the console shows. So this is the log input. So you can click on the log for any container that's managed by Shipyard, graphically view what's going on in any one of those containers. Um, you know, here's a recap there. That's, you can have different applications deployed. That's a higher level view. You know, it can drill in the images. Uh, and this is the container console. So if you were to drill in the container and select the right action, then you can actually interact with a shell through your web browser. So you don't need to log into it or, or do any magic. This can all be managed through a UI with a unified security model and whatnot. Um, so here's a basic two container example. Um, so a two container example implies you have two Docker containers, you want to separate them. Um, typically you do that by, by sharing ports or configuration or env environment details. Uh, so suppose we have you know, a container that's called container that we run. And then we have another one called alias that we link to container. And basically it follows the same paradigm as the Java class loader where the child is aware of its parents' configuration or state. Um, so that means, you know, if alias is spawned from container, it's going to know everything about container. And it's going to have environment variables created from the container. Well, that's good and bad. It works. It shares a configuration. But if you ever take one of these down, it breaks. So it doesn't really work in a distributed environment. Um, but this is just an example of the type of uh, environment configuration it'll automatically create. So if you do this kind of, of an operation, these are the variables, that environment variables that will show up in the child container. And there's a more advanced example here. The Atlassian people have actually dockerized all their components. So like Crucible and Atlassian and all that, they have docker containers and examples for how to use environment variables to wire everything together automatically, which is kind of cool. And they've created an ambassador pattern, it's basically as a proxy. Um, they have a simplified version of this that, that excludes the additional ambassador and the networks. You could have consumer ambassador, then Redis or whatever the service is. Uh, the nice thing about this is that the consumer connects to the ambassador, and if you want to connect to a different Backend service, you can do that just by reconfiguring the ambassador and taking that down. It doesn't affect this. Um, but the benefit here is that you don't have to restart all these services. So you can leave this ambassador running in the backend container. You just maybe toggle your consumer and reload it. Um, this ambassador can be stateful and reload the correct configuration from whatever ambassador has been repointed to. So uh, there's more, more in-depth information here. It's a kind of a lengthy topic, but it's, it's an interesting pattern to decouple that. Um, and again, there are some UIs like that Suru app automatically does this. So you can configure uh, an application or a PaaS through a web application to do the same thing. Um, so this basically shows a very detailed example of container linking. So you have big server and client server. So you start up you know, Docker run Redis and then have an ambassador tie into it. And then you start a client server ambassador and then your client server the CLI, which talks to the ambassador and this guy has the configuration to talk to the other ambassador. And then those two share environment variables. So it's hidden from the client. Um, 
So advanced Docker, so how to load balance this. Um, there are a variety of technologies and ways to do this and different components you can run within a Docker container. You can create stuff, you know, if you're talking about ports, uh, a lot of existing applications already do software balance and load ma management, you know. You have different Tomcat containers running and load balancing that way into different IP addresses and each container is its own IP address. It all works the same way. Uh, but within a container, you know, a goal could be, you know, you have a software load balancer, different app servers and HA storage services or, or other, you know, services for caching or whatnot. But the cool thing is it's, it's all running within the same environment, maybe on bare metal, maybe within a single VM. There are instances in the Amazon where people are, have been run over a thousand Docker containers in a single Amazon instance and it scales. So I don't think there are, there are many other uh, comparable technologies that can do that. Um, distributed producer consumer, this is a common distributed computing paradigm. A lot of people do this on data grids, you know, Hazelcast or, you know, coherence or whatever. This is another way to approach it. You can have a layer of you know, RabbitMQ message queues, just a layer of Docker containers, containers managing it, maybe one. You know, some backend processes or web servers running that maybe. And you can have a farm, a, a virtual farm of Docker instances that actually handle the processing that act as consumers for those messages. Um, and that can auto scale. There are components to do that. So you, can, you may actually have Docker containers in between here that receive the requests and handle that brokering. But again, this is, whereas in the past, DevOps would have to manage this rabbit configuration, setting up brokers and maybe all the consumer information, you know, set, configuring in the web browser. Now it's being pushed into container configuration. It's being parameterized. It's being, you know, designed into the architecture. So it's, it's more of a convention rather than a, a DevOps deployment decision. So about that, um, how does that, you mentioned uh, auto-scaling. Is there an equivalent of a uh, elastic load balancer for it so that I can scale out onto my onto Docker, multiple virtual machines as necessary if I have more capacity, or how does that work? Yeah, I believe um, that is, yeah, it's one of these, uh, there's Hipachi and then there's Flynn has an auto load balancing capability. And this is one of the past frameworks. That's kind of interesting and um, it's kind of an evolving area so it's an interesting topic. So we can just jump into this right now because this is a pretty cool framework I wanted to demo out but it's kind of involved. Could have probably spent a couple hours on this alone. But basically it's a framework, you know, it's based on a key store. Um, you know, they have a way of sharing state or configuration between containers. Um, these are system D, uh, which is basically a version of fleet. And uh, so that way it can assure, share sockets and a syntax to, de to describe services for automatic service discovery and binding and whatnot. And then this is, I believe, where they hook into the library for their scaling. They have a couple of components that are buried within their framework for doing that. I don't think it's as, as uh, useful as like uh, like an Amazon where you can automatically do it with one line of code at this point. Well, that's one of the selling points is that uh, you can spin up these lightweight instances. Um, the example I showed early on that had uh, a couple of Docker instances, it's, it would actually instantiate in less than a second. So if it's a hundred meg and the image is already stored locally, then you can uh, you can boom it basically appears automatically, and you know for a producer consumer that could be very valuable, especially if there's you know peak load is coming in and you have a million transactions you need five new servers and you know a minute you could have all that capacity immediately available. Um, so jumping back to here. Yeah, and this is one of the other interesting things is, you know, using a network to partition the, uh, the containers so that you can hide them or maybe use different NICs to isolate loads. So if your network's saturated uh, for producer, consumer, or any transaction processing within containers, 
you know, across boxes that you can use standard networking tools or techniques to manage that. And this is a diagram for that. So you could have two hosts and different VLANs and you can segment your traffic and manage it and use all the same kind of hardware and tools you use today to, to load balance and partition and whatnot. Uh, so I imagine in the future, um, containers aren't really as visible to load balancers, but I imagine in the future that they will, they might not be that distinguishable from a regular regular host. It'd just be a different type of host. Um, three uh, three frameworks have sprung up. Deus is the one I talked about earlier. CoreOS has a lot of cool features. Flynn is newer, but it has a lot of cool technologies. I think this has auto load balancing in it as well. They have a slightly different way of doing it than CoreOS. Um, Deus uh, works for Docker and Heroku. Uh, CoreOS is, it's not very well documented, just like Flynn, but it's, uh, it's another interesting thing. And it's got three interesting features. So like the three main areas are like sharing configuration, automatic service discovery, you know, kind of taking that ambassador pattern to the next level, making it more configurable, letting a framework do more of the work. Uh, as you saw from the ambassador description, it's, it's kind of complicated to understand and configure. So the framework should do more of that. And this is kind of how the, the space is evolving, I think. Um, and over time, you know, these have been benchmarked and they're adding uh, security features. Um, I think they just added SSL actually to Docker and, you know, their supports on the web. Um, and then some standard database features, you know, for a distributed system, you know, there's a journal and then some kind of internal three-phase commit mechanism for managing that. Um, they have a syntax for describing services. I don't think it's standardized yet. Um, but it's a way to describe a service so Flynn's aware of it. So you can have services that can discover each other based on that configuration, auto-bind each other, and then that'll wire the containers together. Um, so this is discovered as kind of like Zookeeper. Uh, it's just a different algorithm. It doesn't use Paxos, um, but it's very similar. So you have a leader node, and it's for clustering and that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have a backend store. You can actually plug Zookeeper into it, I believe. Uh, any questions? So a, a couple things. One. I'm, this is uh, my first time here. I'm not a, a Java guy, but I, I learned about the Docker piece, so I'm, I'm very interested. I come from sort of like network and sysadmin uh, background. One of the, the questions I have is just in general, working with Solaris and um, zones and containers that way, this feels very similar to that in the sense of like the shared operating system, and then you've got the containers on top, and if you were to patch or update the operating system, it would apply to all the containers that are sharing those same files, is is that the same type of thing that's happening right here? Yeah, it's uh, very similar to jailing. So like you have your process isolation and grouping, and then I think, yeah, Solaris had different features from that from what I recall. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can actually configure them. Um, there is configuration. You could tell a Docker container it's only allowed to communicate over ports that are linked. There's a linking feature. But uh, it will, by default, you know, interoperate with the native NAT. But you can also override that and specify which NATs to configure to. It can actually configure to your, 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 your network as well and bypass the local environment. So you could have like your uh, containers connecting directly to your network. So from an outsider, it would appear like you have five machines instead of one. So. Does it handle um, the CPU 
there's limits and memory limits. Can you say that this container can only use 512 meg of RAM or something? Yeah, there's configuration in the uh, Docker file and in Vagrant so that you can you can set uh, max values for that, like max utilization. So I know definitely you can do that in Vagrant. So you said that it's not easy to get copy things into Docker. Do you get everything in your network port, or how does it work? Uh, I'm sorry. How do you get things into a Docker, let's say, pseudo virtual machine? Um, you can bring it in well, when you're creating the container. You can use apt-get to pull stuff in. You can also mount file shares and you know share volumes and whatnot. And then a third option is you can deploy components that have an API that you can push stuff into, like Cargo, which would be kind of like if you have Maven, you know, the Maven Tomcat plugin, how you can do a Maven deploy, Tomcat deploy. You can use that kind of paradigm to push stuff into a container too. Greg? Okay, so a lot of this sounds like it's cool if everything stays running, but what happens when the host OS blows up? How do the containers recover from that state when the host OS recovers? Um, or do they? <laughs> that would depend on how they're managing transactions, I guess. Um, if it's a distributed computing environment and you have everything running on one node, obviously that isn't good if you have at least three nodes and you're, you're distributing your processing so you can actually have failover, then you could have failover. But if everything's running in one host, yeah, all bets are off. If it's two hosts, you have 50-50 chance. If it's three hosts, you should be able to recover. Um, but then, yeah, that gets into the application design. If it's, if it's a distributed uh, application, it's using like two-phase commit model, um, if you have uh, the cohort and the manager go down at the same time, you know, it's possible you could have an inconsistent state. So that's where having the right algorithm to manage your commit life cycle is important too. So the container would behave as if it were essentially a regular Linux failure, mm -hmm. um, and it would just simply restart and go through its normal mm -hmm. process. Okay. Yeah. And then there, there's actually another space that's growing is uh, like, the hypervisor type capabilities or, or tools to, to emulate that that are available or growing to. So in his scenario there where the host OS dies, crashes, whatever, when it comes back up, is part of the configuration file, is there a mechanism for like automatically spawning and starting all of the containers for a given node? Yeah, you can have, uh, like based on the, um, the, the Docker file configuration, there's syntax to specify which command to run when the container starts. So if the host restarts and the Docker process restarts, if the Docker daemon is configured on that host to automatically restart, it'll respawn its containers and they'll invoke their, their execution commands. Okay. And then are there any tools that have been developed already for just sort of monitoring the and alerting on the status of the Docker containers? I saw a couple, but I didn't see any worth mentioning yet. It's a growing area. I think they, Docker may be working on a tool like that. They have their, their uh, system or their process monitor or something like that, which looks like it's for that. But it's definitely, since it's not production ready, I think that's an area where they need, needs more growth. You mentioned um, layering Docker images mm -hmm. on top of each other. If I wanted to share not just the host OS, but share like JBoss or something, Mm -hmm. Is that how I would go about getting that functionality? Like I want to deploy a container. I want a container that just has my deployable and then that would sit on top of some the, another image with JBoss in it? Yeah, you could, uh, you could do that, but the way it would work is when you start the container, it would, be, it would use those base images just to pull the binaries into the container. So if you wanted to create like a base JBoss, you know, you start with JBoss 7 or whatever, and then customize it and create your own customized version, and then extend that in a few different ways. You could have your own image definitions that extend that JBoss container as you need it, and then you can spawn containers based on your own custom configuration, as many instances as you want, so. Yep, and then uh, that's where the, uh, well, the ambassador pattern is useful, but managing environment variables and environment configuration um, using the proxies is useful as well. 
So then using Docker files, you know, you're passing around parameters and the actual values then becomes moot. And that's where I think the frameworks like Flynn and CoreOS are more useful because they'll do that automatic service discovery and binding for you. Kind of like what Spring does for Java, that kind of does for containers. So. Um, one of the things if you were listing the four uh, similar things to Docker, and one of them was OpenBD. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys I work with, he's, when I was asking about this, he said, oh, this is just like OpenBD. So if he's thinking that, how, how can you summarize for me how it's not like OpenBD? Like, why would I want Docker instead of OpenBD? Because if you go to Docker's website, they say, you know, this is still in heavy development. Don't use this in production anywhere. And yet, I'm, I'm looking at a partnership opportunity with someone where they're coding it all for Docker. And I'm thinking, it says right there, don't use it for production. I think it's the, I'm not familiar enough with OpenVZ. There is a, um, I have to uh, pull it out. I think the previous presentation, I have a link to it, but there, I found a, a Google spreadsheet that, where somebody actually went through the four offerings and created a, you know, matrix, a feature matrix that compared, you know, all the differences. Some of them use C groups, some don't. Um, but I know one of the goals of Docker is, is, uh, portability of containers, and they have goals to move this beyond Linux or Unix so they can run on Windows and everything. So it's kind of like a VM model. It's not there yet, but um, I think that'd be one of the differences and maybe how they handle security. And also, the uh, if you look at the uh, robustness of the ecosystem, the number of uh, containers that are available for modern, you know, versions of open source components, memcache, or or Mongo or whatever, there's literally you know, over a thousand different components that are available. That's a consideration. And I think also, uh, you know, the number of platforms that are building up around the technology. Um, you know, Docker has a couple hundred platforms that are building up or different projects. Um, I, I know openbz has been around a while and they have their share as well, but that'd be another area where I'd look as well to answer that question. Um, yeah, you can do that. There is a, let's see, uh, it's my first time using this thing. So. Uh, yeah, there's another version of this diagram that actually explains in detail. This is all from Docker's website. They have really good architecture collateral. Um, but basically they have a diagram that shows how a deployment works and the life cycle for that. So you can hot deploy and obviously if, uh, if a node's involved in a transaction, you know, like OSGI would obviously respect that and, you know, upgrade the component in a transaction safe way. I don't know that Docker is necessarily there or some of that might be up to the application. But, uh, you know, if, if a container is upgraded, it needs to be taken offline, and I imagine there would be hooks that would make uh, the application aware that it's being taken down or turned off to, to, to remove it from any kind of load balancing pool. So that's where whatever Docker container is managing the delegation or load balancing would need to respect that. But that's definitely an area. I looked at that. I couldn't find a good example of that before this presentation. Is this does this make sense for environments where you're actually getting a VM? You know you're in a shared environment and you don't have access to this host uh, OS and you're pretty much getting a bunch of VMs from a shared environment. Does this make sense there? Um, I think the answer to that is it depends. Um, there are certain apps where it, I don't think it would make sense if they're there isn't a reason to change an app. Obviously, introducing this kind of complexity, it adds more maintenance and it's more stuff to do. Um, but if there's a reason to change an application that's already deployed in that model, if you have like, you know, a database, an app server, a cache layer, and a queuing provider all deployed in the same machine, if that works and you don't need to scale any of those components out, like maybe the app server, you know, needs to scale and you want to pull it out and scale it. If for a containerized, it'd be easy to do. If you don't ever need to do that, then introducing it would be, you know, meaningless. So 
from that standpoint, it'd be, I guess, relative and subjective. It would be based on the layer. So if your queuing layer needs a scale, you could pull that out, create containers. Uh, and also managing the configuration, because you know, containerizing is, you know, it needs to start at the architecture level and like retrofitting a, a legacy app can be, can be easy or it can be difficult depending on how it's put together. Um, but if you're to try and containerize an entire application needlessly, it could make it very complicated, I think. So. Um, that's kind of what we're considering doing at <coughs> company I work for, is just to be able to bring that production type environment to a Windows uh, developer's workstation where you can't spin up five virtual machines on your box, you just don't have enough RAM and processing power to model front end Apache server, Tomcat server, MySQL server, V Linux instances. So using this, you can use Vagrant to create one virtual machine and then use Docker to spin up each one of those boxes and model a bunch of different machines only using one VM on your Windows machine. Any other questions or comments? All right, so at the very end of this, the other presentation, I have like three pages worth of links, but you know, obviously, I'm not a DevOps guy, I just got curious about this. And, uh, well. Let me do that over again. <laughs> I guess if you go to the end, it stops. So, yeah, so there's a lot of links at the end of it. All this is up on SlideShare. Um, but yeah, this is an, a, just an interesting area that's evolving. So, there's comparisons, you know, people, a lot of this Docker versus Chef versus Puppet type discussion, and you know, in some ways they're complementary, in some ways they aren't. Uh, you know, other use cases, Docker and Mesos, which is kind of cool, like just producer consumer over that, like a new way of doing MapReduce. Um, you know, a lot of DevOps examples. Uh, Deus, which is kind of cool. Uh, and Shipyard information. Uh, the Docker book, which is coming out. I'm, uh, based on what I've seen on, on during my research, I think I'm not sure what they're going to have in the book that isn't already available. Uh, and Docker's blogs are there's a lot of information there, and there's a lot of Red Hat's got a lot of information there as well. Um, but that's it. So thanks for coming and listening to me ramble for an hour and a half. <laughs>